So, uh, thank you for taking your time for our sessions. It is uh, Infuse Your Business with Machine Learning. I'm Kaz Sato. And I'm Black Lakshmanan. Yeah, uh, we are going to have this session uh, by us. Uh, uh, let me introduce at first, uh, myself at first. So, I'm uh, Kaz Sato. I'm a developer advocate for Google Cloud. I have been working at Google for six years. And for the last two years, I have been working as a developer advocate. Uh, who is like an uh, evangelist for developers. So I usually, usually have my talk at meetups and sessions, uh, events like this, and talks about the Google products, such, uh, especially for the data analysis products, such as Google BigQuery and machine learning products. And for the first part, I'd like to uh, going through the, all the basics about machine learning and neural networks, and I will, ask, uh, I will pass the stage uh, to Zach for the, la the latter part of the session. Okay? So I'd like to start with the question, what is machine learning? Uh, how many people have used machine learning in this venue? About half people, like 50% of people. How many people have you tried a neural network? Oh, it's about 30%, like 20%? Yeah, it's kind of average. I ask these questions every time I have the, the sessions in many events. So maybe usually less than 10%, uh, if it's a usual web developer conference, less than 10% has experience with the neural network. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is all about data and how to have the predictive insight from data by using the algorithms of machine learning algorithms. So rather than you know, going through the scanning the, all the past data, you want to have any predictive insight. You want to predict about futures based on the past uh, uh, the history of the data. So to do that, you want to use the uh, machine learning algorithms, that is, uh, using the different computing paradigms from the existing IT systems. So let me start with this very interesting demonstration called Playground to understand what is the difference between the usual IT systems and the machine learning. If you have the, uh, this, uh, this kind of data sets, what do you, how do you classify them? What kind of the program code you would write to classify these two data points? Well, we have uh, X1 and X2, two inputs, and if you plot the data points, you can see there's a two groups, blue groups and orange groups. Maybe you can think them uh, of a, a number of the heights and number of the widths of people, so that you can have the groups of the adults where people have the higher heights and higher weights, and people of the children, where you have the lower weights and lower height. And if you are a programmer, and if you are asked to classify these two group of data, data points, you may want to draw a diagonal line like this at the arbitrary position uh, to, to check the some thresholds, whether the, each data point exceeds the threshold or not. If it exceeds the threshold, it must be an adult. If it's not exceeding the threshold, it must be a child. But the thing is that with the traditional IT uh, systems, the, all the programmers is responsible to instruct computers how to solve this problem with uh, some arbitrary parameters like weights and biases. So by choosing the right W1, W2 weights, you can you know, change the uh, angle of the uh, this straight line. And by choosing the right bias or threshold, you can move the position of the lines. That is the, how the usual programmers would write his or her code to solve this problem. But how the neural networks can solve this particular problem? So let's take a look at the real demonstration. Where is it? I lost it. <laughs> Where is it? I think I... I think I close the uh, windows when I finish the last talk. Sorry about the machine learning demonstration. Oh, demonstration, yeah, this is it. Uh, yeah, this is the uh, very interesting demonstration called Playground, where you can, ha you can design your own neural network inside browser and train it in real time. And where we have, this is, we. It, uh, here we have the one neuron here. So it is not a network, it's just a neuron we have. And we have two inputs, x1 and x2, uh, as an input features. And we have a bunch of the training data here. And let's look at how the neural network can, neural network can be trained by using the training data. 
Do you see if you, I click the training start button, then gradually the diagonal line tries to move to crash by the data points in the correct way. So usually those, the initial parameters are the randomly selected uh, in machine learning algorithms, but the optimization algorithms of the machine learning is tries to tweak the parameters like a W1 and W2 and bias to find the best way to draw a straight line to crash, crash by these points. So if you are a programmer, maybe you think that it's much faster uh, to write the program code and specify a certain you know, weights and biases by yourself, but you do not in machine learning. You let computer think by itself to find the, what's the answer. Where is it? Okay. Yeah, maybe let me spawn it and move it to the other. Yeah, that's much better. So what the neuron did is to choose the right combination of the weights and biases. So what the neuron did was exactly the same things you would have done when you're writing the crash, uh, solving the classification problem. So the single neuron takes any number of the inputs, like x1, x2 to xn, and multiplies those inputs with the weights, like a weight one, uh, w1, w2, wn and multiply those the inputs with weights. And that's exactly the same things you would have done uh, with your program code. But the huge difference here is that you let the computer try to find the best combination of the parameters. By using these technologies, you can even have a single neuron crashed by a handwritten text image. So if you have a bunch of the handwritten text image in grayscale, you can just use a single neuron. You don't have to build a whole sophisticated deep neural network. You could just have single neuron to crash by those images. How do you do that? At first, you have to convert all the grayscale images into a bunch of the numbers. So as you can see, the, the, this grayscale image, which has 20 times, 28 and 28 uh, the dimensions, you can convert them as 784 numbers in a single vector, and put them all into, an, in, into a neural network or a neuron as an input of the, uh, or to the neuron, and multiply with the weights from W1 to W784, and takes the summation of everything. So it's a very basic, simple mathematics. And if the summation, the value of the summation exceeds certain thresholds, you can think that image must be a number, a digit of one or a digit of eight, just like that. And by training the neural network, by using the uh, tens of thousands of the training images, handwritten text, you can have a neural network generate very unique pattern, as you can see on the screen. Where these are the, the patterns you can see in the weights after the training, where the blue color represents the positive value, and eight uh, red color represents the negative value. So for example, if you take a look at the weights for the number zero, you can see the, uh, these zero-like patterns, blue patterns, is automatically generated in the weights. And historically, if you want to do the image analytics or image recognitions, so those professionals for image recognition has been trying to find the best filters or patterns to, do, to detect any objects in the images. So that is where the people, the human programmers, have to put all the knowledge and experience on that. But the most important thing is what's happening in the AI booming right now is we are now letting the neural networks to find what would be the best pattern, best filter to crash find this problem. So, you don't have to have humans or programmers to generate those filters. These filters is automatically generated. And after applying those weights uh, as filters and adding some biases, and you can get the result like this. If you have the image of seven, the probability for the seven would be the highest, like this. And 
I was talking about a single neuron. So you can use the single neurons to have neural net ne neurons to recognize and handwritten text, like, the, like I said, like I explained. And now you can have more and more neurons between the input data and output data to make the neural network much smarter. This is called a hidden layer. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> They're having fun. They are excited. Let me open these second demonstrations. So I will need just three new ones to solve this problem. So here we have a single hidden layer here. And we have three neurons in the hidden layers. And we have another problem here, the, the training data for classifying the problem, where we have a bunch of blue dots inside this circle made of the orange group. And for humans, it's really easy to understand the underlying the, the patterns in the training data set. So just you can watch the data set, and you can easily tell that the blue is inside the orange group. It's easy. But it's not so easy for the programs to understand this pattern, especially for the single neuron, because a single neuron can only draw a straight line in the 2D space. So it can classify the problems into a two uh, spaces. It's so-called linear classification. But this is a not linear uh, problem. This is a non-linear problem. So where we have to use the hidden layers to this problem. So by starting the training of the neural networks, you can see the neural network gradually trying to capture the patterns hidden inside the data set like this. Let me try it again. This. So you're seeing the computer is trying to find the optimal way to capture the patterns. And if you take a look at what each neuron is doing, then you can see each neuron is doing very straightforward, very simple linear classification. For example, this particular neuron just draws our lines to classify each data point is in a blue area or white area. Again, this neuron is doing the same thing, drawing a straight line and do the linear classifications, whether the data point is in the left or right. And that's it. So very simple. But having the multiple layers of neurons, you can have the neurons in the higher layer, like here. Here we have a single neurons as an output layer. It can extra, uh, take the, all the outputs from the uh, neurons in the hidden layer so that it can make a little bit smarter decision on classifying the data points. It can listen to the, the, what each neuron is saying from the first layer and make a final decisions. Because the, this neuron says, is saying this thing, this neuron says these things, so that the final neuron can make a much smarter decision like this. And if you put more and more neurons here, the decisions will be much more smarter. So as you see, the now neural network is smart enough to capture the very sophisticated uh, polygons inside the data set. So what does neural, uh, hidden layers do? Hidden layers is mapping inputs to a feature space and classify with a hyperplane. And this diagram says so much about this statement. So if you have the complex problem like this, you cannot use single uh, neurons to crash by this because it cannot be crushed by the, by the single straight line. So that you would have the, you may want to have the neurons in the hidden layers. The hidden layers, neurons in the hidden layers can tweak the input data to make it easier for the final neurons to crash by the data uh, with the linear classification like this. So the final neuron can just draw a straight line to crash by this, those tweaked, tweaked data set. And again, if you have this kind of the uh, nonlinear data set, you ha by having the three hidden uh, neurons in the hidden layer, those neurons can tweak the data so that the final neuron uh, tries to make it easier for the final neuron to draw a straight, uh, no, flat plane in the 3D space, like a flat plane here, to classify the red part and the blue part. Here's another animation that tells about the, how the hidden layer can tweak the uh, data to extract the feature set. So you see, even if you have a very complex structure inside data set, 
the hidden layer can try to tweak the data in every dimensions to make it classifiable. So by using these technologies, you can even have this double spiral problem recognized by the neural networks. Let's take a look at the actual demonstration for this. So you go to the third demonstrations. Here we have much complex. Now we have the three hidden layers. And the data set is much more complex. It's a double, called double spiral. So if you, as long as you're using the traditional IT programming language, it's really hard to solve this problem. If you, uh, if you want to solve this problem by using the Java or Python with the ordinary programming paradigm, do you want to write many if statements with many thresholds to check whether each data point is in this area, or this area? Maybe you can do that by writing tens of the if statements, but I wouldn't do that. Instead, <laughs> I want to use neural networks to solve this problem. Because by taking some time, especially computing power and training data set, the computer can gradually extract the hidden patterns inside the data set, just like you are watching right now. So initially, the neural networks cannot understand what's going on inside the data set. But if you keep teaching the neural networks, then the neural net network try to tweak the, all the weights and biases, increasing or decreasing each weights and biases a little bit, and see which direction would be the best way to converge the, all the weights and combination of the weights and biases. And now you see the neural network training is converged. And now you get the neural networks smart enough to solve this problem. And again, if you take a look at what each neurons are doing in the neural networks, the neurons in the first layer is doing very simple things. There was three drawing and crash by the data points in two areas. The neurons in the uh, second layer doing really bit smart thing. The uh, neuro these neurons can recognize a really bit complex pattern. And third layer, you can see much smarter neurons. And the output layer, you, could, you can have the single layer that is smart enough to classify the double spiral, just like humans do. So this is how the neural network works. And this is the reason why the deep neural networks can sometimes exceed the human performance. Because it's not instructed by humans. As long as you keep instructing computers how to solve a particular problem, it cannot exceed human performance. But if you let the computers try to find the best way to solve a particular problem, Sometimes it's possible that computers can find the best way to extract the feature to solve each problem. So that was my part. So I'd like to pass, it, pass this to Lack. Thank you, Cass. So uh, my name's Lack. I'm part of the professional services organization at Google. And I've been doing machine learning pretty much all my career. So whenever I see this slide, it always like, sets me back. Because the very first thing that I did out of college, I used to work at NOAA, the US Weather Research Agency, and building uh, models. And I started out doing image processing. So when Cass said you know, you, you know, people would write filters, that people was me, right? So out of college, I was writing image processing filters to find thunderstorms in radar images. And we basically develop all of these image processing filters by hand. My, you know, my PhD was in texture processing. And so when, when you then go ahead and you look at a deep neural net, and you basically say, when you look at a deep neural net, the first parts of a neural net are about basically finding edges. You're basically finding very simple shapes. And then the next uh, part of the neural net is about finding more complex shapes and so on. My work was essentially probably around the third layer of the neural network. But if you go look at a modern day image classification neural network, the number of layers ranges to about 130, 140 layers. Okay, so you can kind of imagine what, what goes through my mind every time I look at a modern neural network and to basically think we were working on these such things very primitively. 
Okay. The second part of the story is, of course, neural networks have been around since the 1970s, so we could have used neural networks where I did, and I did. I basically did. We did a whole bunch of things with neural networks, and I remember a conversation many years ago where we said, hey, instead of us doing all these filters by hand, why don't we just throw the raw pixels out of our radar images into a neural network and have it figure it out? And then we all had a big laugh, because how could you ever get the computational power required to throw your raw pixels into a neural network? Can you imagine the number of layers that's going to need? How on earth are you going to program a neural network to optimize hundreds of layers? I mean, come on, right? This is like ridiculous. We have to go back and start designing our filters again. Fast forward a few years. And here we are, right? We are basically, you know, we can now launch uh, you know, a, a Jupyter notebook, and we basically have one of my colleagues here doing a demo, right, that basically trains on a thousand images to classify flowers. He gets the entire demo done in like an hour. Okay. You basically can classify a set of images, get it all trained, and you basically move on to the next thing in your life. That's essentially what the cloud gives you, right? The combination of machine learning and the, the computational power of the cloud is what allows us to solve the kind of problem. So where uh, Kaz is a developer advocate, he basically goes out, and his role at Google is to basically get everybody enthusiastic to about doing things and basically explaining how neural networks work and how you can do them. I'm on the professional services end, and the people I deal with are always asking themselves, what kind of problems can it solve? Right? What can I do with it? Right? And my answer is hint. It's about the alternative. It's about the things that the alternative when I started in my career, right, instead of using a neural network, the alternative was that I wrote heuristic rules, image processing filters. But that same concept carries through to a variety of other situations. <coughs> Here, for example, is Descartes Lab. Descartes Lab is one of GCP customers. They wanted to basically look at Landsat imagery. So, no, you have Landsat imagery. They wanted to look at the imagery. And looking at the imagery, they wanted to basically determine how much corn or soybean yield was going to happen across the entire country because commodities prices, a variety of things, depend on how much act food actually gets grown. Well, by looking at these Landsat images, right, even before the harvest happened, they were able to basically predict the corn yield and the soybean yield, and they were able to do it five months before the actual USDA report came out that said this is how much got done, right? You basically changed the input. The input used to be you harvested the, uh, like all of the stuff and you measured how much went to market. Instead, the input for Descartes Lab was, let's just image the earth, let's use the images of the earth to basically figure out where all the farms are and how much, right? Look at the uh, greenery content, look at how uh, these things change, and they could use historical data. They had previous years of data from a variety of different uh, locations, and they could basically use that to train their model, and they could basically do the prediction. So the first thing to think about is, is there a different way to do it? Right? One way to do it would be to basically wait and wait for the analysis, wait for the data to get collected. The other way is to say, can this information that I'm going to be doing, can I get it, it from some other way? And there's some other way for Descartes Lab was Landsat images. Okay. Another, so there's these kinds of uh, use cases are all across a variety of industries. So whether you're in manufacturing, you're in travel, you're in retail, you're in energy, you're basically looking at what data do I have and how can I use that data to basically go ahead and predict or estimate something that I don't already know or something that I will know like in the Descartes lab, they would know the corn yield, except it would take them five months to know it. And this is the way to basically get to know it earlier by take, taking advantage of data. And as Cass pointed out, the thing to realize is that don't get, like, you know, don't get constrained by the way you're doing things now. The way a human would solve it right, is not necessarily the way the computer would solve it. So you, you can easily imagine feeding a computer a different type of data set than the one that you're currently doing and using for analysis. 
Okay? So think about the data that is somewhat predictive, somewhat correlated with what's actually the thing that you want to predict. Okay? So remember I start, started out by saying, think about it, it's about the alternative. Eric Smith, we all heard him today. I mean, amazing speaker. When I grow up, I want to speak as well as Eric Smith is. It speaks. So Eric Smith, last year at GCP Next, he basically talked about machine learning. He said, machine learning, this is the next transformation. It's the next transformation for a lot of companies. And the programming paradigm, the way we program stuff, is going to change. The way we program stuff today is that we write rules. We write if-then rules, we write loops, we write iterations, we write logic into our programs. And Eric Smith saying, that's going to change. Instead of programming a computer, you're going to show it a bunch of data. Right? You're going to basically tell it to learn something, and the computer is basically going to then do what you want. Okay? This is an interesting quote, because you have, he has no two, three, no, lots of fully formed thoughts here about what machine learning is, but there is no word in there about the thing that we normally think of as machine learning, which is learning from data. He's basically taking a thing, where do you start? Think about the heuristics and the rules that you currently base your business on, and see if you can do those things in a different way. So it's about the logic. So figure out what you want to do differently, and then collect the data you need to do it that way. Right? So start not with the data, start with the problem you want to solve. The problem you often want to solve is a problem of scalability. Because human heuristics, hand-coded heuristics, don't really scale very well. Okay? So how, this is basically born out of Google experience. The way Google search used to work was you would go to the search bar, and the customer Someone would say, giants, and we need to show you some results. And as we all know, right, the top results on Google are very valuable. Right? So we want, also, we want to be very thoughtful about what is the top result. We want to give our searchers the right result. So the way we would do this was, well, somebody searched for giants, and if they are, do we return them San Francisco giants, or do we return them New York giants? Well, there was a rule, and the rule was if the query are giants, and if the user is located in the Bay Area, show them results about San Francisco giants. If the query is giants and the user is located in New York, show them results about New York giants. If the user is not in the Bay Area, user is not in New York, show them results about big, tall people. Right? That was basically the rule that was in the Google search engine for one query about giants. Think about how many queries happen for every sports team, for every river. Someone searches for the Red River. They're in Texas. We show you the river between Oklahoma and Texas. If the person is in Minnesota, we show you the Minnesota Red River, right? So every geographic feature, stadiums, names of businesses, right? And this is just about location. This is just about location. You have so many other cues about your interests. So you can easily imagine, right? Just, just imagine how big and complex and hairy that code base gets. That's not tractable. And that's when rank brain came along. So rank brain was, let's not hard code rules. Instead, let's see if we can do things in a better way. We have data, right? We know that when we show people results, we know right, what they actually clicked on. And let's use it to train a model to basically predict, right? Using a whole host of inputs, let's make a neural network to go ahead and predict what the top result ought to be. So we were replacing all of those heuristic rules by a neural network. And that neural network, as soon as it got released, right, it essentially became the third most important signal among hundreds of signals that decide what the ranking of the page is going to be on the, on the Google search result. That's basically what, what Eric Smith is driving at when he says that 
machine learning is a new way of programming, right? But because what we are doing is that we're replacing the way we do logic. Right? We're replacing the way we do logic. Okay. And starting with that, right, you know, when you're successful in the thing that the company is most famous for, everybody takes notice, right? So four years ago in 2012, there was pretty much no deep learning models in Google. Right? Uh, as quarter four, 2016, we're basically at 4,000 models, right? And this is all over all of Google products, apps, Gmail, Maps, Photos. You guys have seen it everywhere. And it's become this thing that you basically get everybody in this mindset of, we may be doing things using a seat of the pants rule now, but we're going to collect the data so we can do it with machine learning later. That's essentially going to be the approach that every product team takes. The every product team essentially says, how can we solve this problem with ML so we don't have to keep writing rules and handling specific situations and specific, you know, if this, if that, all those situations. We want to avoid that by doing ML. Right? So you basically get into this process of how do I collect the data? So the, my point here is that you start with a problem you want to solve, Think about the scalability of your logic, and then think about what data you need to collect to solve it. Okay. So, first way, right, if you're going to infuse your business with machine learning, the first thing to do is to rethink your user input, right? Rethink your user input. What do I mean by that? Well, you, on one hand, you have custom machine learning models with TensorFlow, with machine learning engine, with just when GA today. Right? So you can basically build your own machine learning models. On the other hand, building your own machine learning models requires lots and lots and lots of data. Right? So when we talk about you want to build an image classification model, you need millions of images. But we have ways to basically do things with fewer images. Right? We also have what are pre-trained machine learning models. Okay, the Vision API, which is basically already knows how to classify lots of images. We have the Speech API, which already knows how to transcribe text. It is a waste of your time and resources to go build a speech model. It's, you might just use an ML model that we have trained over lots and lots of data. So when you look at our video API that got demoed today, that's not on my slide yet, right? So that's basically on trained on so many more videos than it's even possible for you to think about, right? In terms so there are better things for you to do. Every, all of us are in businesses. We have core focus. So those are the things that we want to focus on. The things that Google has done, you want to take advantage of. And that's where the pre-trained models come in. So number one, let your users talk to you. Okay. The days when you could have expected your users to come in and type are gone. Okay. Uh, these days, right, on, when if I want to go somewhere, I'm basically on, on Google Maps, right, I pretty much never ever type the name of the place I'm going to. It's all just voice search, right, especially because I'm on the go. It is completely, completely voice search. And you know, maybe I'm on the leading edge, but a huge fraction of searches on mobile happen through voice. Okay? And when you build applications, increasingly, your users are going to expect the same thing. Okay? So for example, there's a company called Ocnet, which wanted to basically build the system that needed to figure out how much is my car worth. Okay? So people have done this before, right? But what Ocnet said was, I'm going to rethink my user input. And what I'm going to do is, you want to figure out how much your car is worth, take a photograph of your car. Take the photograph of the front of your car, of your dashboard, of the back, of the sides, everything. Take a bunch of photographs, send it to us. We'll tell you how much the car is worth. So from the photographs, Ocnet would determine like, the, the model of the car, who made the car, which year it was, the, uh, the condition of the car, all of that stuff, and tell you this is what it's worth. Now, put yourself in somebody's situation, right? You're a consumer. You have two possible web websites. 
One website gives you a form that's two pages long. Another website says, send me a couple of photographs. Right? You obviously see that now ML is a competitive advantage. Right? Rethink your user input. Your user input doesn't need to be forms. Right? Your user input doesn't need to be forms. How many of you use Google Forms? Quite a few of you, right? And have you noticed that recently, when if you're creating a Google Form, you can say, for example, right, you, you ask a question, when do you want to meet, and it auto-suggests answers. Right? It auto-suggests possible answers. It helps you dynamically build stuff. Right? And that's essentially the kind of stuff that we're talking about. We're talking about being able to know right, and limit the amount of user input that somebody has to give you because you can kind of in, in to guess what their next question or the next answer is going to be. Okay. Here's another example right, of using images to take action. It's an application called Meeting Nanny. Okay, which basically has a camera on a conference room, the same camera that's used for video conferencing. Okay, it's connected to the calendar. So all it does is basically looks at the room, so the meeting was supposed to start, seven minutes later, nobody has shown up, it'll release the room so somebody else can come use it. Okay? So using images to take action. Okay? The user input here is all completely automated, but it's an image. It's an image. It's an image of the room, so it can figure out if you can do this or not. Okay. <laughs> and another customer of ours, Ocado. The way Ocado used to work was somebody sends an email. You had somebody sit there, read the email, figure out what was in the email, and decide what to do. The way they do it now is that they use the natural language processing API. Again, a pre-built model the NLP API model, they were able to use it, and they can use that model to basically say, oh, here's an, here's an email that came in, and this email is a customer expressing satisfaction. So this is what I need to do. This is, a, this is something that's about billing. The customer is frustrated about billing, so I need to triage it, send it to somebody who handles billing. Right? So an email comes into the company, it automatically gets triaged, sent to the right department. This is the kind of stuff that your customers are going to increasingly expect. Right? They're not, you're not going to be able to get away with form responses that are like just you know, boilerplate stuff. It needs to be really, really, really meaningful responses. And you can do this. You can do this now with machine learning. Okay. Another example here. Okay. Lots of us, right, when we build applications, we ask for customer images. That's a scary thing, because we're all you know, we're working in a variety of different industries that have regulatory stuff. Okay? So here's a customer right, uh, that wanted to basically prevent violent <coughs> images from being uploaded. Okay? And uh, you know, they also wanted to prevent like, uh, no, unsafe for work images. And here's an example of the Vision API at work. It's able to focus in on the image on the left and say, OK, this is actually a safe image. It's just showing a couple on a beach. But the image on the right, it basically flags as being unsafe. And it turns out that if you look at what the machine learning algorithm is focusing on, that's the yellow stuff and the red stuff, it's focusing on the finger of the person holding the gun, and apparently the person is squeezing the trigger. So this is showing somebody actually in the process of shooting, noticing that this is now a violent thing and removing that violent scene. Right? It's, it's at that level of crispness is what ML operates at. Another thing that you can do, so you can reimagine re your user inputs. That's one <coughs> thing, right? You basically look at images, treat images as bona fide inputs. Think of speech as bona fide input. Your input doesn't just need to be text. Right? That's what we normally think of. We're writing computer programs if our input is text. It doesn't need to be text anymore. It can be images. It can be audio. But the other thing that you may want to think about is your business processes themselves. Reimagine the way you do your business process. Change your business process. What do you mean by that? Right? So if you're thinking about ML as a rocket engine, the thing that can take you places, the fuel is going to be data. You, as long as you have data, you can go places with it. 
So what are the kinds of things that we're talking about, right? Your typical customer journey here, you know about business processes, your typical customer journey is to go look at any kind of manual thing that you are doing and seeing if you can do that manual thing in a better way. So this is Global Fishing Watch, another GCP customer, and they basically would do manual analysis of global fishing fleets. So the idea was that they would look at the, where, the, where the ships are, basically figure out how often the ships had gone to a particular region to basically see if that region was being overfished, whether somebody was fishing above their quota, whether somebody was using the fish, fishery resources more often than they should, whether they're going into protected waters, all of that kind of stuff. And they would do this, they had manual analysts kind of doing this all the time. Okay? Some of that stuff could be automated. And that's what they did, right? So with machine learning, you could, do, you could basically take, think of all that manual, a lot of things that were done manually. You couldn't, you, you, they didn't automate the whole thing, but they could basically automate different stages of it to basically then allow the analysts to basically bring their experience and expertise to the parts that really mattered and basically make the routine stuff so much more easier so that it could be done with ML, okay? So, the typical customer journey often here involves find the things that your analysts are doing, the things that they hate doing, because it's just they come in the morning and they're just doing the same thing over and over again. They get tired because it's very repetitive. And there's the kinds of things that you can automate because A, you have the results of all of that manual analysis that stretches back many, many, many years. That's the key thing, right? You're, what you're thinking about is what kind of data do you have so you can actually automate it. So the data that you will have is because you've done this analysis in a manual way for so long, you basically may have five years, 10 years, 15 years, how many years your business has been around or how many years your industry has been around of the results of that manual analysis. And you can basically take all of the inputs that go into the manual analysis and you can take the outcome and you can train an ML model on it. Because all you need is the input and the outcome. Don't worry about, oh, in order to do this, this person looked at this other thing and all of that stuff. That's fine. Right? That may be the way the human did it, but the ML model may be able to basically hone in on other things that are representative of the situations in, 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 you know, in concern. But when we're talking about data, right? You, most of our data analysis as humans, most of our data analysis often, we write, you now if, if you go to look at our data scientists, our data engineers, our data analysts in a company, what kind of data are they dealing with? Relational databases. They're dealing with structured data. But in a typical company, 90% of your data will be unstructured data. What do you mean by unstructured data? Emails. Tons of information in your emails, reports, lots and lots of information when somebody goes to a field site and writes a whole bunch of field notes. What are you doing with that data right now? It's your company's data, but you can't do anything with it because, A, you're thinking, I cannot actually put it in a structured form so I can write a SQL query on it. Right? But that's where ML can help. Okay, ML can help you find insight from unstructured data. But unstructured data is hard. Unstructured data is hard. Okay, I did an ML boot camp yesterday, okay, and we basically talked about how to do structured data, because that's easy, right? That's when you're doing a boot camp, you want to show people how to do things, like the, the, like, no, the, the easy thing, right? Let's just let's get started with ML, we'll get started with structured data. Unstructured data, images, speech, text, those are hard. Those are very hard. That's where you basically go hire PhDs to come do the work for you there, right? But you don't need to do that all the time because what you can do is that you can take your unstructured data, whether it's images, whether it's audio, whether it's video, whether it's freeform text, and you can use the pre-trained models out of GCP the Vision API for images. What is it going to do? It's going to look at your image and tell you what's in the image. 
It's going to tell you this, the, this, this image has a mountain pass in it. This image has a dash in it, etc. Right? It's going to tell you what's in it. And you can also build on top of our image models to basically classify your own particular things. Right? You want to basically determine that this image contains part number 8341. No problem, right? Give us enough images of parts 8341 and 8348, and we can basically tell you which one's which. Which one's a four-inch screw and which one's a six-inch screw. Those are, those are pretty easy if you build on top of right, our models. So you can do images that way. You have audio, use a speech API, and you basically take that and it'll give you text. So what do you do with the text? It's freeform <coughs> text. Well, if you have freeform text, use a natural language API. So what the natural language API will do is that given freeform text, it will tell you who's mentioned, what's mentioned, the sentiment. It will tell you this is a full sentence, this is a phrase, this is, these are the links between these things and so on, right? So you can basically do that. You can do video, right? We just saw that. So all of those APIs essentially give you places, labels, people, events, sentiment. And at that point, that is a perfect thing to go ahead and feed into your custom machine learning model. And now it's not as hard a problem anymore. Okay? Because you're now dealing with essentially structured data. Right? And you're basically deriving insight from it. We've done the hard part of going from unstructured data to things that you can now do your model training on. The, the third way that you can basically use ML in your business is to delight your users. Okay? And what I mean by delight your users is to basically figure out what your users want before even they realize they want it. Okay? To, to basically do that, like, that spark of delight. For example, right, how many of you thought that your email program had to suggest to you what the response was going to be? Right? But now, right, 20% of all users of like, Inbox, and now Gmail also has it, 20% right? of all responses on mobile to an email start out with the smart reply. Right? Uh, how many of you have used smart reply? Still getting out there, right? It's 20%. It's still 20%. Basically, the way it works is you get an in email, and the email program, inbox or Gmail, suggests to you three possible responses to that email, right? So, for example, in this particular email, this guy says, like, you know, can you send me something? And this person, right, basically, the, the three responses are one of them is I'm working on them, the second one is I just sent them to you, and the third one is no plans yet. Three pretty good responses that cover the spectrum. So you can start with that. You basically save the person three words of typing. So this can apply to your business as well, right? So if somebody comes and they ring the bell in your grocery shop, and you already know that the location that they're in, the shelf is empty, you can actually delight them by saying, we realize that we are out of product X. Would you like us to give you right, these other three alternatives? Right? We, you can take a rain check. We can offer you a discount on another product, et cetera. Imagine how the user's experience is going to be different from right, they call in, and we basically have them wait. And you basically, you know, you, instead of running them to the rigmarole, the moment they basically say, I need help at this point, you basically realize what help they need because you know what they're currently experiencing. You guys, you know, we're probably seeing some of that already, right? Uh, these days, when my flight gets delayed, like, I automatically get rebooked, and the airline company is already doing that. That's the kind of stuff that we're talking about, right? You know what your customer is experiencing, basically solve it right there. Right? Don't, you don't, it's, many things don't have to go through the normal business process. If you know what they are, you can kind of uh, you know, predict it. Okay? So here's another, to, to end, the, you know, in terms of like, you know, 
solving a problem that you didn't know existed, right, in a completely different fancy way. Okay, lots of people create their own home videos, right? They create, and they want to put a background music track on it. But when you're putting a background music track on that video, what do, what do people do? They go basically get a popular track and they throw it onto the video and then YouTube basically shuts it down because of a copyright violation, right? Because you're using music that you shouldn't be using. But ML is now good enough that you can basically go to a video and you can basically say, I would like you to generate music for me that's jazz, that is kind of low key for the first three minutes. It crescendos between minutes three and 3.30, comes back down, and then basically ends with a flourish. And that music can get generated, it'll be jazz, it won't be, like, it won't be Wynton Marsalis by any means, but it'll be pretty darn good for a home video. Okay? Those are the kinds of things that we're talking about, right? The world, I mean, I'm so excited about what ML can do. I'm so excited about what you guys can do with ML. So thank you all very much.